in the garden. The night in the garden. There was in Matthew chapter 26, verse 30 or so, we're going to begin. And you can remain seated because I'm just going to walk you through the scriptures today. There is a lot that took place in the garden. They had just finished the, the Passover breaking of bread and communion that he took in the upper room. Jesus was getting ready for what was coming. Judas set out to betray him. Everything was coming into place. For three and a half years, Jesus ministered and prepared the people for what was about to take place. It's interesting, we don't get to read about a lot that happened in his 30 years as a man. He was a boy. He was a teenager. He became a man. And in the Jewish tradition, you were not considered a man to the age of 30, nor were you allowed to be a teacher or a rabbi until the age of 30. And that's why Jesus had to wait until his 30th year in order to begin to do the miraculous and to begin to teach. Now at 12, we caught him slipping away and talking to the Pharisees and teaching them. and They were amazed at the authority that this 12-year-old boy had. So even then, he knew that there was something he had to do. And can you imagine for 30 years knowing the last three and a half years of your life are going to be both wonderful and tragic all at the same time. Knowing what your end was going to be. Everything had to go toward that end. Even his disciples and Peter saying, no, don't, don't let this be, Lord. Don't let this happen. And the Lord had to rebuke him. He said, I'll stop him. No, 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 no. You've got to let this happen. This has to happen. This has to take place. So I want to talk to you about the night in the garden. And I went through and I looked through Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. These four Gospels told from four different point of views, four different people who were there through the whole process, each of them telling the same story. But some of them have a little point or a point of view where they caught something the other guy missed. And John was always incredibly revelational and he saw things differently than the others. And Luke was more of a physician. He saw things more from the practical physician, doctor end of things, if you will. He looked from the physical nature. Whereas John was always looking through the eyes of the revelator. He was always looking through the revealing side of who God was. And so as we begin to walk through the Scripture, I'm going to interject the pieces from the other writers that were not listed in Matthew. But Matthew had the most complete story. So we'll begin reading there. Matthew 26 and 30 begins, And when they had sung in Him, they went out in the mount, into the Mount of Olives. So before they made that walk to the mountain, they sang a hymn. Each one of them recorded this fact that they sang together before they made their trip to the mountain. And in Matthew 26 and 36, the Scripture says, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Now, I don't know about you, but this is my teacher. I've been with him three and a half years. And suddenly he's saying, you sit here, I'm going to go pray yonder. I'd have been the guy that was sort of slipping up where he was going. It'd have been me to kind of creep up and say, I know you said hey, sit here, but I'm so curious. I want to know what's going on with you. I can see that you're heavy. I, I love you as a father. You're my rabbi. I'm concerned that you're concerned. And I've heard everything you just revealed to us in the upper room. I'm the guy who's kind of creeping close going, what's really going on? If Jesus is feeling this heavy, if He's praying this hard, what's about to happen? And Mark 14.33 says, And He taketh with Him Peter and James and John and begin to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So, so he told all of them to sit and then he called those three and they moved a little closer in Matthew 26, 37. He says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. 
And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Can you imagine knowing what's coming? And we wonder why in our lesson today, God doesn't show us some things. He's been there. He knew what was coming. He knew He had to go through with it, but it was heavy. It was heavy. If it's possible, let this cup pass through. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. Can you imagine? You're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders and you're about to go through the most horrendous pain. And the ones you count on the most are sleeping. And the God in him realizes they really don't understand what's about to happen. But the man in him just wishes they would stand beside him and, and, and stay up with him and pray him and be there for him. But they were sleeping. What, he asked him, he asked Peter specifically, what, could you not watch with me one hour? And the word watch really relates to the term to watch and pray. Could, could you not watch and just pray with me just, just one hour? Just one hour of the time that I'm going through. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes the spirit draws us to places that our flesh does not want to go. Sometimes the spirit will pull us into places that we have to drag our flesh into. We have to convince ourselves this is what needs to happen. You can't ignore the pull of the Spirit, but your flesh just really doesn't want to get involved in that. Your flesh doesn't want to push the plate away from the table and get up and go to the other room and pray. It wants to eat. But the Spirit of the Lord is drawing you to where you look at that food, and if I eat that, I might even get sick. This draw is so strong. Sometimes the flesh is weak and the Spirit is willing. It's, it's pulling, it's calling. Verse 42 he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Mark 14 and 40 adds this, And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy neither wist they what to answer him. What, what do we say to God? This is God in flesh, suffering, heavy. This is our Messiah. What do we say? They didn't know what else to do. And so the Bible says that they were so sorrowful that they slept. In other words, you ever been so depressed that the only way out is to go to sleep? I don't know what to do. I'm feeling so heavy. I'm just going to take a nap. I've been there. Just so heavy and wearisome, you don't know what to say. Nothing that you could think or do would change the situation. So I'd rather just go asleep, go to sleep and get away from it for a little while. And that's what was happening with these disciples while Jesus was carrying the weight of the world. Matthew 26 and 44 brings us right back in. And He left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times in that evening, he went away and he prayed and he said, Lord, I know that I have to do this, but this is hard. Is there any other way? It, can this happen any other way? And then again, he would end the prayer by saying, nevertheless, if this is it, this is what you've asked me to do, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do. Luke 22 and 43 comes in and says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was in such agony that as he prayed and trembled under intercession, his sweat became so thick that it was like blood dripping from him, hitting the ground. And some theologians say that his agony and strain was so great 
that he had burst capillaries in his body and that he was actually sweating blood. That's how great the stress and the pressure was that his that blood actually slipped into his sweat glands and he was literally sweating blood. He knew what was going to happen. He understood what was coming. And that's how great the sweat and the bleeding and the earnestness and the heaviness that was on him was. In Matthew chapter 26, 45, it says, Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto him, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, He is at hand that doth betray me. And while He yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master. And he kissed him. Isn't it interesting that when Peter tried to resist him and tell him, Don't do this. Don't let them do I'm not going to let them do this. He rebuked him and called him Satan and told him to get behind him. But here is Judas that comes to him who betrays him with a kiss and Jesus calls him friend. But Jesus said unto him in Luke 22 and 48, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Matthew 26 and 50, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, laid hands on Jesus, and took him. And then I'm going to bring you into what John saw. The pieces that we don't see from the others. In John chapter 18 beginning in verse 4. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon Him, went forth and said unto them, Who seek, Whom seek ye? So when Judas showed up with these multitudes of men with staves and, 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 and swords, He asked a question whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto him, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. I don't know how the other writers missed that. Or why that wasn't significant to them. Maybe they were trembling and terrified and wondering what all is about to take place. But the revelator remembered the fact that when Jesus said, I am. Remember Moses coming to the bush in the Old Testament. And he said, who do I say sent, you, sent me, Lord? And he said, you tell them, the I am sent you. Jesus standing in front of these who come to take him and said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus, now he said, I am. And they fell to the ground. The great revelation that poured out of his lips knocked them to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. He never ceased to be their shepherd. He was constantly protecting them. This is for me to bear. Let them go. This isn't about them. Verse 9, That the saying might be fulfilled which He spake of them, which Thou gavest Me, I have lost none of them. Verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. And that servant's name was Malchus. And in the other Scriptures, Jesus reaches over, picks up his ear, and reattaches it to his head and heals him and makes him whole. And it's kind of confusing when you think like God. The guy who's coming to kill you, he loses an ear and you pick it up and put it back on. Me, I'm like, hey, give me another sword. Let's go for the head. <laughs> we don't know what Peter was aiming for. 
He was probably aiming for his neck. The guy moved and he just got a deer. But the Lord said, put that up. Not right now. And he picks the ear up and he heals his enemy. He heals his enemy. Matthew 26, uh, verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword unto, into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? He could give me 12,000 angels. But how then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? I could call down 12,000 and Your story don't mean nothing, son. I could call 12,000 angels if I didn't want this to take place. This has to take place. I appreciate your zeal. I appreciate your love. Put your sword up. This has to take place. John 18 and 11 says, Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my Father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? That's what I came to do. Back to Matthew 26, 55. In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves, for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple. And you laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Jesus said, I sat in the temple with you. I taught you. We know what happened in the scriptures. He healed many of them. He cast out devils from them. They sat there and listened and received of him and took from him. And then now the same, some of the same ones, or he wouldn't have made this comment, the same ones that were there then were standing in front of him with swords and staves. And he's asking a simple question. Have you ever needed that with me before? Didn't I sit with you and talk with you and minister to you and heal you? You didn't need the staves and swords then. Do you need it now? And then he went with them. John 18 and 12. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Matthew 26 and 57. And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. There are some who berate Peter saying that he must have been some kind of coward that he followed far off. They didn't get close enough to the action. We know that he betrayed Jesus three times when they questioned him there. And John, the revelator, was the one who was all the way in right next to him, right behind him as they carried him. And he was right there to the very end. And I, I believe, because you always read about John being right at the heart of Jesus, that that's why John received the revelation that he does, because his ear was always at the heart of the Master. He could feel his heart. He knew what he felt and the things he was He was the closest one to Jesus of all the twelve. Peter was not too far off. But we'd be right Peter and don't talk about the other ten. Where were they at? They were scattered, son. They were long gone. They were scared to death. But here's John the Revelator who wrote the book of Revelation and here's Peter falling from afar off and he denied him three times. All of this took place in one incredible night that Jesus saw coming, that Jesus could have called 12,000 angels to stop. But because He already knew it had to take place and this was His cup and the only person who could take the cup from Him He had already talked to and said, Will you? And He said, I can't. This has to take place. He agreed to it. He drank the cup. He began to walk through the most horrible time any one individual would ever have to walk through. I've done studies on the beatings that he took and the cat of nine tails that were made up of metals and glass and things. And when they beat his back, they tore his back like his skin was ribbons and the blood flowed so thick, 
such a gruesome sight. Made him look like an animal. And before the blood could even congeal and begin to heal and patch, they threw a garment on him, making fun of him, throwing this purple robe across him, and then walking over to another would snatch it off. And between the process of his bloody back and that robe being laid on them and them taunting and smacking his face, the blood had dried and congealed into the garment. When they retore it off, they reopened every wound. No one has gone through this kind of torture like Jesus went through that we know of. And he wasn't even done yet. They pushed into his head the crown of thorns, bursting capillaries and blood flowing everywhere. He went through the most torture of any man, any human ever. He saw all that before it happened and yet he still said, nevertheless, your will be done. If that's the only way, Lord, that my 12 disciples can be saved who've walked with me for three and a half years, then Lord, let's do it. But knowing all of that was coming, He still went forward. And here is Peter struggling to understand whether he's supposed to grab a sword, yell, cry, run away, but he couldn't stay away. Yeah, he denied him three times, but he would just move to another spot. He wasn't going nowhere. He cared enough to stay close. He wanted to know what was going to happen. Should I do more? Shouldn't I do more? But when I tried to do more, he rebuked me. So I have. Can you imagine being them? And here's the point of all of this that we have to come to grips with. It wasn't the Jews that did this to Jesus. It wasn't the Romans that hung him to that cross. It was me. It was my sin. It was my failures. It was every time I reject his word. It was every time he drew me in and said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I don't keep them all. So, so I fall out of love and in love with him over and over again. And every time I do, I wonder, is it, is it a fresh pain like when they ripped that robe off of his back? When I do that? And I know that we are frail and, and we are human and we make mistakes and we're going to make mistakes. But are we ready to repent of them? We need to get justification far away from us. Because it should have been us. It should have been me. He took those lashes on his back 39 of them was 40 saved one. 39 of them with a cat of nine tails ripping his flesh off and his sinew off of his back and the blood was full. He took all those so that I could call on his name and healing could come to my body now. He did that for me. He went to that cross. He, he endured that persecution. He endured that flogging. He carried his own cross up most of the hill until the one Simon stepped in and helped finish the trek. But after all the beating and abuse that he went through, he still had to make part of that journey on his own. And it wasn't over. He had to get up on top of the hill where they took these, these railroad spikes and drove them through his wrists and drove them through his feet and hung him up on a stake. All the jarring that took place, all the wounds that rubbed. Can you imagine his torn back as it raked against the board that was against his back? All of that pain. And yet he still said, you are worth it. I'll drink this cup because I love you that much. I love my disciples that much. I love my people that much. Even though they come at me with swords and staves. We don't like it when Jesus starts working in our life. We ask Him to. But when things get all kind of hectic and swirly and don't make sense and we don't understand what He's doing and we want to know what He's doing. And God, why'd you let this happen? And why'd you let that happen? It's almost as though we come to Him with swords going, what are you doing? He's simply saying, I'm doing this for you. Do you trust me? When your world's falling apart all around you, do you trust me? Because I did it for you. When my world went to bananas and back, I stayed the course because of you. I had you in my mind. He had me in his mind when he went through all that. But I was the one who did it to him. It was my sin that had to die on that cross with him. I did it. 
I can't look and point the finger at someone else and go, the Jews hung him there. The wow, Lord, you should destroy those Jews. It was the Romans that did it. Destroy those Romans. I can do all that and I can point the blame, but the truth of the matter is I have sin in my life. And because I have sin in my life, there had to be a sacrifice. And he said, I'm going to have to do this myself. He robed himself in flesh, felt our iniquities, felt our pains, never sinned, was perfect, went to a cross and died on the cross where we should have been nailed. So that we could come before Him and repent. And have a way of escape. He became the perfect sacrifice. Because even at our best, our sacrifice is imperfect. So all He asks of us is that we love Him. Keep His commandments. Repent of our sins. Believe in Him. Be washed in His name. Be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Washing away those sins you just repented of. And then he says, I want to come and abide with you. In John chapter 14, once again he's reminded them, hey, I have to go away talking about this man. This man has to go away so that, I, so that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will come and be with you and in you. Jesus could only walk around and touch His disciples and comfort them with His words and pat them on the back and, 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 and kind of encourage them along the way. But by this process, He made an avenue where when this body died, my spirit will come into you. And so then I not only can... I, I can go deeper than just a pat on the back. I can go right to your heart. I can go right to your emotion. I can move inside of your mind. I can help calm you and be more peaceful and help you further along the road than a pat on the back will ever do. He did all that for us. And He made a way for us. Everything that He went through, He did for us. And we need to take responsibility and stop blaming everybody else and say, I did that to Him. That's why He stood up on the day of Pentecost. And, and when Peter, this man who denied Him three, three times, suddenly infused by the Holy Ghost, a new creature. God took all of his weaknesses and, and made him strong and he stood and he preached and he proclaimed to them. That's exactly what he said to them. This Lord, you crucified him. You did it. And they looked at him in 2 and 37 and they said, what shall we do? We did this to the Messiah. Our salvation. What can we do? And that's when they said to them, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off. Guess who we are? We're the ones that are far off. We're nowhere near Jerusalem. That same promise that He spoke to them, the same thing that they were guilty of, that's us. But He's made a way back. He's made a way back. All of this is about the Creator wanting a new relationship with His creation. He wants a relationship with us. Why can't we make a little time for Him other than Sunday? Other than Wednesday, Thursday? Why can't we make a little room for Him in our life? Because He can do so much more with our life than we could even fathom. My wife has some incredible testimonies. I have a few of my own. I'm sure some of you have testimonies about how God's intervened in your life. And all He asks in return is for a relationship. We've done some things that's created a wall between us and Him and that sin has to be dealt with through repentance, through baptism, through the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But we have an opportunity at a newness of life and He's given us every... He did all of this for us because He loved us. He called His enemies and those that were going to do the most harm to Him His friend because they were going to be the ones to get Him where He needed to be for us. He was a, they were friends to the cause. So sometimes when you're going through your trouble and your trouble drives you to your knees, your trouble is your best friend. That thing that's frustrating you, aggravating you, feels like it's destroying you, if it drives you to your knees... It's your friend. That's what Jesus would call it. It's your friend. Amen. I wonder if the musicians would come. I'm going to close up. I know that we are in a season of revelry and fun, and this is seems like it's more of a 
Passover Easter message, if you will. But, but hey, you know what? God's clock don't always work like ours does. And when He wants to get my attention, I don't care what season it is, I'm just going to say, here I am, Lord. Talk to me, move in me, stir in my heart. And in and, 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 and these seasons, because there is so much pagan tradition behind all of it, the push of all of it, it actually causes us to move toward a carnal state of mind to where we just want to play games and be with friends. There's nothing wrong with being with family, nothing wrong with playing games. But we still got to make time for the one that makes everything possible. So in this season, while you're spending time with family and friends, make sure you think about what He did for you. This is supposed to be a season about His birth and reflecting on that. And this is really why He was born. This, everything that culminated in those two or three days, this is why He was brought to us. That's what we should be thinking about. And, and we ought to do it all the time, not just because it is the season. If we can walk with a repentant heart remembering everything that He did for us and making those things that we've done wrong right when we have an opportunity to make them right, keep that relationship fresh. Don't let everything He did be in vain in your life. Don't want it to be in vain. Why don't you stand with me this morning as we close. And I don't mean to embarrass anyone today. But I do hope today that some of this made you uncomfortable because I'll be honest, it made you uncomfortable when he started talking to me and I'm watching a football game and yelling from a team and the Lord starts nudging at me, hey, come here. And I gotta walk away from the game and get away from that carnality for a few minutes, that little bit of fun, and go find a place to pray and read. And he says, Remember this. Yes, sir. more important than a little football game. It's more important than one, one year worth of Christmas presents and family time. This is a lifetime of relationship. He gave it all for us and all He has in return is give me your life. Let me work it. Let me mold you. Let me shape you. Let me fix the things. We're so busy trying to fix stuff. When I try to fix stuff, I make a bigger mess out of half of it. But if I can back up and say, Lord, I'm doing the best that I can, but I realize if I touch one more thing, I'm just going to explode. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I need you to intervene and give it back to me. That's why I like that song, I Give Myself Away. Because, yes, He's blessed me with talents. Yes, He's given me things. But ultimately, I need Him more every day. The more I learn, the more I learn I need Him more. The more I learn, the more I research, the more I get to know him, the more I realize I don't know him well enough. And that's the way it would be for us. There are altars here that are open. If you like to come pray, pray on the front pew. You can pray where you're at. This is your heart. When you bend it before the Lord, it can become your altar place. But I just want us to pray. And it helps me to get my face in the carpet sometimes or in the pew sometimes instead of standing. And there's other times I want to stand. But I want us to really think about what He went through. And, 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 and what He went through for me, have I gone through enough for Him? Have I repaid that debt? Have I even come close to making the first payment? And am I thankful enough? Have I responded enough? What He really wants is us to just respond. Just to say, Lord, you have no I don't know where I'd be. While they're playing, I'm going to find a spot here and I'm going to pray and let this, let the Lord minister to me. And you can pray there, pray here, pray on the word. But let's give our face for a few minutes. If it's difficult for knees to kneel, then by all means, just sit down and lower your head. Let's just drop our head in reverence and pray out loud. Hey, speak to Him. He wants to hear your voice. We can meditate all day long, but He wants to hear your voice. Talk to Him. Let Him hear you speak. While they're playing, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. See you out of us.